Heart Month press launch. Welcome to everybody. As you know, each February we celebrate Heart Month and we use the opportunity to bring to the attention of the public the various risk factors for heart disease and how to promote heart health. My name is Deborah Chen. I'm the executive director of the Heart Foundation and I will take us through the program this morning. This year, we chose to focus on the impact of diabetes on the heart. We all know about diabetes and we all know about heart disease, but many people may not know that diabetes can lead to heart disease. It's almost seen as if it's two complete separate entities. So we thought that we'd use this month just to give the public some information about how diabetes can lead to heart disease and what persons with diabetes can do to prevent heart disease. In doing so though, they will have prevented all the other ailments that come along with having an uncontrolled high blood sugar. Today, we have some special guests with us. We have Dr. Davidson from the Ministry of Health, Professor Boyne from the University of the West Indies, and we have our Vice Chairman, Mr. Winston Barrett, who will speak to us in due course. I would now like to invite Dr. Davidson to bring greetings from the Ministry of Health. We work very closely with the Ministry of Health in several areas, and Heart Month is no exception. Dr. Thomas Davidson is the Director of Chronic Diseases and Injury Prevention in the Ministry. Join me in welcoming Dr. Davidson. I would like to acknowledge our specially invited guests. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge Mrs. Deborah Chin, Executive Director for the Heart Foundation of Jamaica. Um, the guest speaker today, Professor Michael Boeing, um, who is a Professor of Endocrinology and Metabolism at the University of the West Indies. The Shortwood Practicing Primary and Junior High School students and their teacher and also um, Dr. Rowan Wilkes, um, who I understand is unavoidably absent, but I'd just like to acknowledge him. The board of the Heart Foundation, all specially invited guests. It certainly is a pleasure to be here this morning. Good morning. Good morning. I hope we're having a fantastic morning. So again, um, the Minister of Health certainly is delighted again to be here for another launch and another year to commemorate Heart Month. And this year, um, the theme is quite timely looking at heart disease and diabetes. In 2011, Jamaica and the world um, committed to fight NCDs. And even before that, the Caribbean region in 2007 decided that this was something that we needed to address based on the epidemic that was facing our nations. And it's through the advocacy of the Caribbean region and working along with our NGO partners that we were able to get to 2011. Last year, 2018, was a critical um, point in this response with the third meeting of the high-level um, le high meeting on non-communicable diseases the Caribbean community, the world came together again to commemorate and to pave the way forward. We know that um, non-communicable diseases has been a major killer globally and in Jamaica. Specifically, when we look at cardiovascular disease, more than a third of um, Jamaicans die over the age of five years old from just this disease. And then we know that the next big group is cancer and then diabetes, which is 12.7%. But what we know is that there is a clear link between diabetes and heart disease or cardiovascular disease, where it's not only just a complication of diabetes, and you'll hear more about that, I guess, from our guest speaker, but diabetes contributes to that number, that big number which we see um, with respect to cardiovascular disease, both heart disease and stroke. And this is just 
by the nature of the disease itself. Even with diabetes under control, we know that persons, um, if they have other risk factors such as tobacco use, harmful use of alcohol, if they're obese, if they're overweight, um, if their cholesterol is high, or if they have dyslipidemia, um, that's a medical terminology, um, then we know they are at higher risk for cardiovascular disease. So we at the Ministry of Health, we have recognized this along with the rest of the world, that this is a public health problem, a public health crisis, and an epidemic that we need to address. And so we have been working with partners such as the Heart Foundation to really meet this goal. And in keeping with the theme, it's time to deliver, we are working to deliver and to ensure that we reduce this public health crisis. And so one of the key goals is to reduce premature mortality by, 20, by a third by 2030 and by 25% by 20. 25. And so launches like these and initiatives like these are just one of a very complex and comprehensive strategy that we're engaging in. So we look forward to hearing further about the link between heart disease and diabetes. And Jamaica continues to work on some key programs like our Jamaica Moves program, which focuses on three areas, which is to promote physical activity, healthy eating, and age-appropriate health check with NCDs, addressing mental health, addressing some of the shared risk factors that diabetes has with the major killers globally for NCDs. We continue to implement and roll out our national strategic plan, and so we encourage persons to continue to work with the Ministry of Health and the Heart Foundation so that we can continue to make Jamaica great because it is a great country. So thank you everyone, this is the land we love. Let's work towards 2030 and let's beat NCDs. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dr. Davidson. I would just like to point out that the risk factors are the same for all the NCDs, pretty much. So if we can control and prevent the risk factors for heart disease, it will also impact diabetes and cancer and so on. So even though we're um, discussing one particular area of an NCD today, by following a healthy lifestyle, and I'm sure Dr. Boyne will be telling us more about this, we actually will prevent several diseases. Um, in terms of, you know, our lifestyle and so on. Now, in keeping with our theme, the diabetic heart, are you at risk? We have a very special guest today, um, Professor Michael Boyne. He is a senior lecturer or a senior lecturer in the Tropical Medicine Research Institute, a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons Canada, and he got his med medical degree at the University of the West Indies. He joined the staff of UE in 2000 as a lecturer in endocrinology and was promoted in 2006 to a senior lecturer. Over the period, Professor Boyne has established a record of distinguished original work in the field of the development origins of health and disease and diabetes research. This effort has made a substantial contribution to, the un to understanding the impact of maternal and early development factors in determining susceptibility to type 2 diabetes and obesity. Professor Boyne is a well-respected teacher having taught at the undergraduate and postgraduate level in endocrinology and nutrition. He has served as president of the Caribbean Endocrine Society and is current president of the Association of Consultant Physicians. He is also a member of the editorial board of the West Indian Medical Journal. Please join me in welcoming Professor Michael Boyne. Uh, Deborah, you're too kind in your comments, but thank you so much for the invitation to come and speak. Um, I, whenever I'm asked to speak on diabetes, etc., I always try to go the extra effort. Um, 
And, um, but on, and of course, because it is a hard foundation of Jamaica, I had to make sure I make even more effort. Um, so I bid you greetings from the University of the West Indies and the Associate Consulting Physicians of Jamaica because we share common goals. And as Dr. Davison also mentioned before, the NCD epidemic which is upon us, um, we all have to get all hands on, on board to, to succeed. So I've been asked to speak a little bit about the diabetic heart, are you at risk, is a title that was given to me. I'm gonna tell you how I interpreted it, and uh, we're gonna try to see how we break it down. Um, I don't have any conflicts of interest for this talk. And the first thing I want to do, let's see if I can get this clicker working here, okay, is that you may recognize this person. And if you do, it shows your age paper. <laughs> so who is this person? Sanford, right? Played by Red Fox, a comedian, right? And Red Fox, whenever in, in Sanford and Son, had that very classical thing right here. You saw that, right? And, and anybody remembers what he would say at that time? Oh, Elizabeth, I'm coming. His dead wife, he's referring to it. And he would mimic that he was having a heart attack. And in 1991, he was about to give an address like what I was doing here now. I needed a similar thing and fell on the ground, but he didn't get up because he did suc um, succumb to a heart attack. So reality followed the art. Now, just in case if anybody didn't know, because this is the launch of Heart Month and the Heart Foundation, is that people who have a heart attack, because it could happen to almost anybody, and God forbid it happened to me standing up here like Red Fox, right? But these are some of the symptoms that people, and I think if you ask the average Jamaican, they are aware that these are things that can occur. Um, and in terms of chest pain or discomfort, Although many people, especially with some women, they don't recognize that heartburn may be a symptom, or they may just be feeling tired and nauseated. So it can also be quite subtle. But we wanted to make the link of diabetes and uh, what happened with Red Fox or, or, or Sanford. And uh, one of the reasons for this is because, as many of you are aware, that we are in a pandemic pandemic meaning that it's a worldwide thing that's occurring when it comes to diabetes. It's not just a Jamaican thing or a Caribbean thing, it is a worldwide thing. And so we anticipate that even now, when there's almost half a billion people with diabetes, this is gonna grow exponentially over the years, right? It has already been growing exponentially. If you went back in time 50 years ago, um, if a person had diabetes, they were looked almost as an oddity in the health system. But now, every grandmother, every grandfather, every brother and sister has diabetes, part of the pandemic. And probably, whoops, it, it jumps a bit a little bit. Um, probably many of us will know that we use different classifications for diabetes, but this is the most common one where we say that most people have type two versus type one. And basically what we're generally saying with type two is that this is something that is also, even though you may have risks that you've inherited from your mom and dad, it also is what happens because of your environment. So what is your environment that makes you increase your risk of getting this type two diabetes? Well, once you get older, if your weight is increased, and we got very specific, so women in the audience, which I see quite a bit, if your waist is above 31 inches, right, or if you like centimeters, 80 centimeters, you're at risk. Men in the audience, if your waist is above 37, you're at risk, right? Or if you are one of those persons who does the fancy BMI calculator when you go to the doctor or the clinic and they work out your height for your versus your weight, it turns out that if you are too short for your weight, we call that an elevated BMI, and you're also at risk. And if you already had high blood pressure, and God forbid if there's also a family history or if the woman had a history of, of diabetes during pregnancy, all of this can increase your risk. And therefore, 
people, their blood sugar will rise and you will be diagnosed with diabetes. So as you saw in this slide, any two of the following puts the person at risk, meaning that if you look on this slide and you can pick out two of those risk factors, you should have been screened for diabetes or you need to go and get screened after this talk is over, right? Over the age of 45, a woman, no, what happens in the Caribbean is that women disproportionately have more obesity. But if you have obesity, or, or as we mentioned, or high blood pressure, all of these will increase your risk. Now, what's very interesting is how we tie these things together, the, the obesity and the diabetes and heart disease, was actually um, exemplified to our neighbors to the north. And I'm going to show you a little bit of a slightly technical slide, but just bear with me. Our neighbors to the north are Cuba, not North America, right? Cuba. Whoops, here we go. It goes out of time. Let's see. Well, we're not. Looks like we're, well, uh, I think the slide is out of sequence, but we'll, we'll come to the Cuba slide in a second. Um, this slide is for the people who are the economists in the room, right? Where it says, um, what is the cost of diabetes in the Caribbean? And this was a PAHO study um, done in collaboration with the University of the West Indies. And as you can see, for the whole of Latin America and the Caribbean, the total estimated cost in the year 2014, so we're already five years out of sync, was $69 billion. $69 billion, of which Jamaica's share was nearly $2 billion for that year. I'm not talking about over a 10-year period in that year. And I think our Minister of Finance would love to have $2 billion each year to play around with. When you look at it in terms of costs, I mean, in terms of breakdown of, um, of, of complications, you see CVD, which stands for cere um, cardiovascular disease, in other words, heart disease, peripheral vascular disease with poor circulation in the lower limbs, eye problems, kidney, and nerves, you see some costs there. So I just want you to realize that heart disease takes the lion's share of the costs when it comes to complications of diabetes. So that's one of the reasons why the Heart Foundation exists. And uh, here's a slide that I was looking for with Cuba, right? So what we want to show in this slide, in the, if you look in the middle slide, this was, or, or the middle graph, this is a snapshot over time from 1980 up onto the 2000s. And Cuba's obesity rate, if I might show it right here in green, was rising. And then somewhere around the early 90s, their obesity rate fell. And why do you think it fell? Because there was the collapse of the Soviet Union. They got into hard times. The population was losing weight and nutritionally deprived. So they were losing weight, so their, so their BMI went down. And then afterward, things started to get better again, and it started to go up. Right? And as you can see here, here is the incidence of diabetes. It follows what's going on with your weight. Right? So as your weight improved as a population, your rates went down. And then when times get good, it goes back up again. And then here now in the red is the mortality rate. So the mortality rates also started to change. Now, there was a little bit of flattening off right here. That's because they got better in treating it, but not better in terms of preventing it from occurring. So we say that diabetes increases your risk 20-fold to become blind, 40-fold of developing an amputation, 25-fold to end up on dialysis, uh, two to five-fold to develop a heart attack like Sanford, and stroke is around two to three times. And even though these are the common risk factors, or sorry, the common complications, I wanted to let you know there are other complications that people don't always remember are diabetes associated. Did you know that diabetes is associated with dementia, which everybody's talking about nowadays? It is associated with deafness, a two-fold increase for deafness. Us men, we know about erectile dysfunction. Well, you don't need to confess to that man, but, but we're just saying that. Cancer is associated with diabetes. A lot of people didn't know that. Liver disease, depression, 
lung disease. In other words, what part of your body does not or is not affected by diabetes? I think the only one place that I haven't really found is baldness, right? I, I'm not aware of diabetes causing baldness, but almost every other part of your body it, it seems to affect. But coming back to the heart disease, because I was asked, the diabetic heart, are you at risk? And what do we mean by that? Well, you can have coronary artery disease, which results in a heart attack like Sanford. You can have congestive heart failure. You can have arrhythmias, or you have heart, um, your heart is beating irregularly. And all of this can manifest itself also, too, from heart attacks. So worldwide, persons with diabetes, two-thirds of them die from heart disease. In other words, when I talk to a lot of patients, I say, why do patients with diabetes die? They say, well, you know, the sugar killed them. But they don't know what that really means. They don't say the sugar killed them. Now, I'll show you a slide a little later on that it was true that in the days before we had any forms of treatment, you'd have died in a, in a particular type of coma associated with the diabetes. But nowadays that people are getting treatment, it's not, that's not the most common way for them to die. Most of the times they die because they're going to get a heart attack. And a heart attack is because diabetes is going to accelerate the hardening of the arteries, what we call atherosclerosis, where you're going to more efficiently lay down fat and cholesterol in the blood vessel. So this process which occurs as you get older becomes super efficient in that diabetic individual. And once that leads to an obstruction and worse with a blood clot on top of that, then you're going to have, here, here I am coming, Elizabeth, as Sanford was to say. But we also recognize that diabetes causes heart failure, which looks a little bit different. It's not as dramatic with the clutching of the heart and chest pain. But in this case, the heart is not beating as well as it should. Either it doesn't contract as well or relax sufficiently to allow blood to enter the heart. And when persons have heart failure, which is again very common in persons with diabetes, um, they complain of shortness of breath, they may have palpitations, and they have swelling of the legs, right? But this can progress and can lead to also death. So heart failure is slightly different than having a heart attack. Now a heart attack can lead to heart failure, and various of heart failures can lead to arrhythmias and heart disease itself, but they're all together. Now, here is an international study. An International Diabetes Federation did a study looking worldwide at persons who are diabetic and having heart disease. Two in three had risk factors for developing a heart attack. Right? Two out of every three. One in four never discussed or couldn't remember having a discussion with their healthcare provider about these factors. But most of them thought that they weren't at risk. Even though two-thirds of them are going to die from heart disease, most of them thought that everything is fine. So there's this disconnect between I'm okay, but the reality is that you are high risk. And one of the things that I'm going to say is that if you are diabetic, you're high risk. End of story. And we'll have a slide about that in a little while. But once you're diabetic, you're a high risk individual. And if you want to know if that is true, go talk to the insurance companies. They will tell you, right? They know that if a person is diabetic, they're going to change their premiums. Or sometimes they will deny care because it's a high-risk environment to develop heart disease. Um, Trevor Ferguson and a few others did this study some time ago that when they looked at the University of the West Indies, two-thirds of every person with diabetes who was, admi who was admitted had some measure of cardiovascular disease, similar like what we were just saying before. It's true here, it's not just international, it's also true here. So many of them had um, hypertension and heart, um, um, myocardial infarctions and heart failure, et cetera. But two thirds, and especially unfortunately, our women folk are bearing a higher burden of the problem. I also want to point out something too, that many persons in the, in, in the public they associated diabetes with amputations. Oh, you know, grandma lost a toe, or my boss at work had an amputation, etc. And many people don't think of it much. They'll say, well, they lost a limb. But guess what? 
That was telling you that this person has a lot of cardiovascular risk factors and they're very high risk of dying. So amputation is a marker for death. There was a Steven Seagal movie, I think, called Mark for Death, which was very popular in Jamaica. I think it ran at Carib for about two months or something like that because it had a Jamaican drug lord. Well, it wasn't really, the guy wasn't really Jamaican. He's put on a Jamaican accent, right? It's called Mark for Death. But a diabetic person who also has an amputation is Mark for Death. Let me just show you one thing very quickly. Look on this slide here. So here's a person who has never had a lower um, a lower extremity amputation. Here's somebody who lost a single toe. They just lost one toe, right? Yeah, they can put on a shoes you don't even know. They walk around. Well, guess what? After five years, more than 25% of them have already died just by losing one toe, right? Meaning that the, that loss of the toe is a marker that this person has underlying heart disease and many of them died from heart disease afterwards. So if you see someone with an amputation, tell them they need to get themselves checked out. Now you can imagine also if they had a below knee amputation where they got it somewhere around here. Look at it, at five years, only about a quarter of them are still alive. Right? Mark for death. We also have to be careful as doctors and healthcare providers because some of the treatments that we use, if it causes a sugar which was too high, then to become too low, that itself can trigger a heart attack. So both extremes are not good, too high or too low. So one of the common things whenever I see a patient and I ask them, you know, and I'm treating them for their diabetes, have you also had low blood sugars? Because if they have low blood sugars, they are very, increased risk of unfortunately having that precipitate a heart attack or stroke. So how are we gonna treat these people? Now everybody has a treatment or a cure. Now this picture is a historical picture of, of over 100 years ago, a reported diabetes cure that was being sold. Now can you read what it says about diabetes cure? What does it say? Safe. It's a safe diabetes cure. That's a good marketing tool, right? But that's why it also tells you you need to read your labels. Because when you look down a little further, what does it contain? 15% ethyl alcohol. In other words, the equivalent of drinking just pure alcohol. Not pure alcohol, but drinking alcohol, right? So this safe cure really was just making you drunk so you didn't care about your diabetes, right? It's a, it's a plug for reading food labels. Right? But there's been this holy grail where we've been trying to find how can we treat individuals. And I just remind you, as we said before, that 100 years ago, before the advent of any treatment of diabetes that we have nowadays, whether insulin or tablets, if a person developed diabetes, like this kid here, generally speaking, they would die within one year. The average lifespan was one year for a kid they would die in a sort of metabolic coma. So you see that child looks like they're emaciated, like they just came out of a war camp. That's the way how they would die. And you can see that same child, two months later after some treatment, you can't even recognize the child, right? So treatment started to make a difference. Rather than dying within a year, they were living longer. And if you were an adult and you had diabetes, you would die within eight years from this same thing. But all of a sudden now, with the treatment of diabetes, people are living longer. So, so here's what they used to have to do before. They had to get animal pancreases, or pancreata, if you like to use a proper term, and distill it, grind it up and distill it, just so that you could get one pound. There it is, that one pound of insulin, right? And then that person would now need to take that impure insulin and inject it into themselves four times a day using an 18-gauge needle. Those of you who are in the healthcare sector know an 18-gauge needle is not a small needle. It's a luge needle, right? <laughs> this child would have to do this four times a day. And what you'd have to do is 